Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and here with me is Dominic Falcaro and Bill Sherman of Anne Juliet, nominated for Best Orchestrations. Congratulations on this nomination. Um, I know, Dominic, it's your first, but Bill, you've previously won for, for In the Heights. Did you have any advice for how to, how to navigate this for your collaborator? Oh, yeah. No, uh, no. <laughs> I, I, people keep on asking me what it's like to do this again, and the answer is, was, knowing what I know now and watching this through Dominic's eyes is like really fun. And because the last time I did this was a long time ago, let's call it, uh, 50, it was a long time ago. And uh, uh, I don't want to date myself, but uh, but yeah. And so just getting to experience it again is like by far I'm honored and, you know, it's genuine. I feel like just super honored about it. And and, and doing with you, I think it's like a perfect situation. And we, we love the show. We love everything we've done. And so to get to experience this together is really cool. Yeah, and I think theater and the world of theater is very new to me, but after living in it for a minute, it's also uh, a lot of pieces of things that I had done before, but they all just sort of fire together at the same time. You're working with vocalists, you're uh, leading a band, you're figuring out how to make some of these sounds happen in a live setting. Like, it's just that, yeah, all of these things happen live, they all happen at the same time. So it's, it's, it's elements that I've done in other studio settings and other stage settings, but this is sort of, they all coalesce in this environment. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about this show is that, you know, jukebox musicals have been around for a while, but this one, instead of just one person's, you know, one artist's uh, catalog, they're all written by Max Martin, but performed by a wide variety of artists. Um, so how do you kind of take all those disparate sounds and make sure they kind of sound in the same universe. What is that process like? I think that to me, when we first got this job was the, was the major, you know, not issue that's wrong. It was a major challenge it was sort of like, how do you create a score? How do you create a cohesive thing? And I think you're right. You know, Ariana Grande doesn't sound like pink. It doesn't sound like the Backstreet Boys. It doesn't sound like the weekend or whatever. And to us, it was sort of like, if, if we were going to base the story narratively on Anne Juliet, there's like, you know, there's there's period music, there's lutes and, and harpsichords and strings and things like that that sort of lend itself to maybe that time, although neither of us were around then, but either way. Uh, and then and then it was sort of how do you blend that with pop music to create something that just feels cohesive. And so we were always talking to each other about like, is this too far afield this way or too far afield that way? And then what was the glue and the through line that sort of made it all the same? And I think sonically, at least musically wise, it was strings. Most of Max Martin's songs don't have strings. And if they do, it's one string and it's all the way at the end. And it just sounds like this Bee! or whatever it is to like get it to the end. And so so for us, like util utilizing the strings to really glue the whole thing together was definitely a move. Um, and then and then the rest of the time, it was just sort of like, don't get in the way of a great song. You know, if it sounds good and it works in the show and blah, 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 then like let it be and let it play and let it do its thing. And that was that was a. Uh, that was our goal, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think just the way Max's job with all these different artists who do sound different, like his job is channeling like the best version of them and then the best version of that song. I feel like our job in this context sort of runs parallel to it of how do we make these songs the best version of our story? And so I feel like sometimes it is hitting you with the gut punch of nostalgia of getting the exact right talk box sound of uh it's my life and then sometimes it is how far away can we go from the original and how reimagined can we get with this and so i think by sort of following david's text and luke's direction and then like playing up the choreography that jen built sometimes it takes us kind of on the journey of knowing yeah. which one of those levers we have to pull the most of uh are we hitting you with the the sounds you know and love or are we sort of easing you into sort of our kind of sonic world. And pop songs like this, uh, to me, they don't necessarily feel inherently like they would apply themselves to musical theater because a pop song is this, you know, verse chorus structure, which musical theater often doesn't have, um, which I don't know, maybe could get, you know, hinder a character arc. So how do you take that structure and apply that to this theater storytelling? you cut it and you edit it and you abridge it. But the, but <laughs> the real answer to that is, you know, the, the golden rule of music theater is like every every lyric has to count, every lyric has to move the story along and whatever, whatever that means to the show you're making. And so for us, like you said, I think 
pop music is inherently repetitive. The chorus is usually the same both times. Sometimes the verses are even the same, and particularly with Max Martin songs. Like the lyrics are always like the thing that, you know, his sort of Swedish language and the, the amalgam of lyrics that he's created over time is this interesting sort of thing. But so what we do, what we tried to do was with that in mind, the golden rule of, of always pushing the narrative along was, was editing editing the songs so that they worked in our show. In other words, there's no full song in all of uh, Angelia. Yeah. There is One More Try, which was a new song for the show, which is maybe the only full song, which isn't even really a full song either. But anyway, um, there's no like three and a half minute long full song. So everything is cut to where it's like literally just the lyrics and just the moments that help further the story and just the best moments that we can create. And there's no, you know, it's like that age old expression, like all killer, no filler. Like there's no, there's no, ex there's, there's no double choruses or double verses. It's just the ones that count. And it's just the ones that really help move our story along. Yeah, I love that. And lo like Bill said, like repetition serves pop music so well. And it is so sometimes uh, not helpful in a narrative context. And so sometimes you're making edits to the form to get that correct of like cutting pieces of the song. And then sometimes it's us sort of uh, thinking about how we can, if we're returning to the chorus, how do we make present this one different? How do we amp up the second time we hear the chorus? You know, a song like Show Me Love, we get to the chorus and we arrive to it in a couple different ways. The first time you hear it is the chorus that you know. The second time it has stops and hits and it has a slightly different permutation of the melody. And so we kind of use that box of tricks. And so I think it's also, it is our like musical toolbox that does it. And then it is also sort of the collaborative process in the room of us sometimes starting with a whole song and then sort of collectively through David and Luke and everyone realizing it's like, we don't need to come back to this one and how can we musically find a way to to get to the next part that makes sense and it's really fun hearing how you've reinvented a lot of these ones to, with a totally new sound was max you know ever precious about what you could do did he have requirements of you know can and cannot do this <laughs> so the, the story is i mean i'll tell you yeah. the story is is uh is he said to us uh if you're gonna, if it's gonna sound like this, like the song we know, make it really sound like the song we know. So like when we go into like our boy band medleys and stuff like everybody and and stuff like that, it's like okay, that sounds like the thing, and we all know that. And then if it's if it's a complete departure, like um, like hit me baby one more time, the second song in the show doesn't sound anything like hit me baby one more time. If we're gonna go there, then go all the way there and really explore it being a completely different idea and a completely different sound and a completely different tonality and all that stuff. Uh, early on in the process of this show. We, uh, we did like, um, we would orchestrate a few numbers and we would bring in a band and we would play them for Max and he would come and listen to them. And uh, for the most part, let's he say, was very he was supportive. fairly yeah. supportive and like he would give us little tips and like little sound things or little things that he just like recalled from, um, you know, his past and stuff like that. And he's like such a genuine collaborator. I think if you would ask Max what he prides himself on the most is he always says we, he never says I, and he's always sort of like um, bringing his collaborators into the conversation and like definitely saying that it's not just about him, it's about all of these people that he works with, which is really like an amazing, humble situation. But what we, we were doing a version of Show Me the Meaning of Being Lonely. And for whatever reason, Dominic and I thought we should do this other thing. And so we did it and uh, Max did not like it, but in a very nice Swedish way, he said, and it was kind of adorable at the moment, he went, you know, I, I get what you're going for, but it kind of sounds like a college thesis project. And which to us was like a total like <laughs> kick in the head. Like, it's like, oh, it hurts so bad. And we both looked at each other like, ooh, we struck out on that. That's really, a swing really, in a mess. Yeah, it was but... a real big swing. But that for the record, for the record, and that was like over many years was the only like real legit yeah. whiff that we ever had. The rest of the time it worked. And like, he would then help us like get it like go further in every direction with it. And so he was very supportive and very collaborative. And now when we do productions of this, he comes and we sort of sit in the theater and we listen to it and we essentially like treat the theater like his studio and we we do it until it sounds good. And so essentially what you're listening to is a Max Martin produced theater show, which is really cool. Yeah. And I love like the stuff, yeah, like Bill was saying, when uh, when we were going to do a reimagining, we were really given the longest possible leash to do that and really got to go super far with it. And the beauty is when we went 
close for certain things. We're not just sort of guessing. We have access to the person that remembers exactly what synthesizer preset. We, we have the vault of the stems of this, which it, to me is like such a kid in a candy store kind of experience of all this is getting to really dive into the DNA of these songs that I, I have such a connection with, that the world has such a connection with. Um, so I love that uh, Max gave us the room to imagine what a string quartet sounds like on Britney Spears, but also uh, provided us with the exact right Tom hits of Roar. And like it's that both of those things are under our umbrella, I think is one of the coolest parts of the gig. That connection you mentioned, was that ever hard to deal with? Like, oh, I really have a personal connection to the meaning of this song because they're cultural touchstones for a lot of us. But like maybe the musical needed something totally different from that. Was it hard to separate? Yes, I think so. There were definitely times where we would do something and it would be like, oh, man, but I miss this, like the original version of it or the original thing. And it would work for the show, but like it went too far from the thing and then vice versa. We would sometimes create something that didn't work at all musically. I don't know. I, I It's so funny, like watching this show now with different people in the audience of all ages and everything and how people react to the show is probably the best part about it. it it's it's people are either nostalgic or they're like ahead of it and they get the joke early and they love the fact that they get the joke early or they're embarrassed that they get the joke early or like um, the, you know, a song will start and they like can't believe how witty it is that we put it in there and that it works so well and like stuff like that. It's it's a lot of that and it's 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 amazing that no matter what age the person is, they 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 have that sort of incredible reaction to it. And it's 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 almost it's that's to me is my favorite part. Like, yeah. Just watching people watch the show is really, really, really incredible. I also think any there there are sometimes those like little bit of like uh about you lose a section or uh, some sort of attachment, but I think it is far outweighed by how fun it is to think about reimagining what if Teenage Dream starts with pizzicato strings and is hilarious. A song that's about, that we think of as very young love is experienced through two characters who are sort of rekindling over many years. And I, I think any, any little bit of uh, nostalgia gets far outweighed by how fun it is to think about the the different places we're able to take you with this music um to me that's the and uh being in a really collaboratively run room and coming up with these ideas together i think uh far surpasses any uh like what we would call i guess demoitis for for old old versions <laughs> oh. <laughs> well you know speaking of the old versions i'm wondering if that kind of collaborative nature makes it easier to kind of trust in your vision when you're swinging big with a song like you know Celine Dion has a, a very impressive version already of that's the way it is but this one you have for Betsy Wolf just has such an incredible build to it when you come up with something like that is it easier to to say let's go for it if you have someone else in the room of course if it's good it's good <laughs> but I also think like uh uh you know um I mean, particularly with that song, I don't think it was ever trying to live up to the original. I don't, that that wasn't my mindset. I don't know, like it wasn't, like those things are those things. Those songs are great and they live in people's minds and things. This is about how those songs worked in our show. So it didn't matter if it was as good or like, I don't even know if that feels so weirdly subjective. Like it, it, it wasn't about comparing to the original. It was about how we would take that song and make it work in our show. And what success was, was not comparing it to the original was how well it worked in our show. And so like, particularly with that, it's like with, with, with that's the way it is, you know, the Celine Dion version is like up tempo. It's like a dance thing. It's like a very different thing. And with us, it, it had a really he heavier meaning in the show. It's, it's sort of like, you know, when Anne's trying to explain about to, to Juliet that that's the way it is and all this other stuff. And so I remember we sat down and Dom just sort of started, we, you know, the, I think it also speaks to sort of the universality of Max's music. Like there's a simplicity to and whatever. And the fact that we can take something that's like a super up-tempo dance tune and turn it into a ballad fairly easily and it really work is pretty cool. And then it was like, and, and then it was, you know, we're getting towards the end of the show. This is a big 11 o'clock-ish number. This is Betsy Wolf. Like how can we make it the biggest, you know, most dramatic thing we can? And so we just kept on going and kept on going until it sort of just like landed in this place and it was like, oh, that's it. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. You know? Definitely. And I think it's also the benefit of, of working in a jukebox format and especially working on Max's music is at no point is the question in your mind of like, 
will this song work? Like, will people like this song? It's like, you're worth, like, yeah. that question has been answered full stop in like for the years. biggest, loudest way. So for us, it's more just about, yeah, it's the truth telling of it and then getting, like Bill said, what, what makes it kind of land the hardest dramatically. And I love for that's the way it is trying to give it that like most earnest ballad-esque place and like you're serving the story and you're trying to just like uh give an actor telling it their most like I don't know uh it's a solo moment on stage and I think about like paying tribute to an actor there and trying to like use music to elevate a vocal and I get that sort of comes full circle back to how I think Max thinks about stuff too of like you're trying you're just really trying to channel an artist as as much as possible and like play to their strengths and I think for that's the way it is like thinking about it uh kind of yeah and it's plotting ballad form and then elevating to a um uh what I guess what we call railroad tracks of like a a full stop and like silence in the theater for a second I think about like creating these moments of uh what I think would uh ultimately kind of be the biggest, most truthful performance. Well, it's a show I think full of those moments. So uh, congratulations, it's an awesome job. Congratulations again on your Tony nomination. And for everyone watching, subscribe to Gold Derby, keep up to date with us throughout this season. And thank you both once again. Yeah, thanks for thanks taking the time. Everybody.